way, when she comes out of the MRI machine, <laughs> does the doctor say, welcome back? Yeah. Yeah. He whispers it, which does he do that a lot after MRIs? Because that's fucking creepy. <laughs> that's very. Was he the doctor like when her baby got stolen? Is that what he meant? Like, welcome back to the hospital? <laughs> no, no idea. Just uh, I, I couldn't help but notice you were doing some pretty serious doodly do's in there. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back to this time. Do you think they show up on the scan? Because it's MRI scan. Do you think <laughs> her brain's lighting up in the doodly do region? <laughs> God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to God awful movies, where each week we watch another terrible movie so you don't have to. I'm your host, Heath Enright. And sitting in a cave of asbestos carved out of the foundation of his house is my good friend Eli Bosnick. Eli, how's it going in the cave? Well, I'm fantastic. Hey, don't do that. Don't. No. Him on now. Oh my God. Meat. I found. <laughs> <laughs> it's Please. a musical, everybody. We're going to get to it in a second. <laughs> is it? All right. We'll get to it. Yeah. We'll get to it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, since we're going to be tackling. The Woman Who Cured COVID this week. It's a musical with Dolly Parton. It seems only fair that we bring on the man who created COVID, Michael Marshall. Marsh, welcome back. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. What I like is, although like a quarter of a million people worldwide have died, that joke has not died. And I thought, <laughs> I didn't realize that would have the, the staying power to outlive the vast majority of COVID patients. So uh, that's, that's great news. <laughs> nope. Nope. Did not. <laughs> so, Marsh, uh, let's let's spoil it. What what the fuck did we just watch? What was that? <laughs> oh man, we watched Dolly Parton's Christmas on the Square, which is the story of an annoying, mean spirited, Scrooge like lady mm -hmm. begrudgingly having a festive change of heart. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a Christmas Karen. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and Eli, how bad? was this musical. Well, if you loved your high school musical, but you wished it was of the quality and sanctimony of the everything must go bin at Halloween adventure, <laughs> you <laughs> will love this movie. Yeah, that's true. Dolly Parton mm. mails it in at Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I got to be honest, I enjoyed this movie at a few different moments. I was I got into it. I like Christmas stuff. I like Dolly Parton. She's very <laughs> endearing. All right, but it also it's horrible and it was a ridiculous experience. It's a musical, <laughs> but it's not. They don't know how to do music. So is there anything you guys would like to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Oh, there was so much to choose from, yeah. uh, but I've got to say... Uh, <laughs> Best worst town meeting. <laughs> You've got all the sympathetic characters in this entire town who are going to be evicted by the mean lady and they're having the how do we stop the mean lady evicting us meeting. But that meeting consists exclusively of ways that they could torture and kill her. So violent. <laughs> so they violent. sing gleefully about choking a lady to death and they're the good guys. <laughs> That's not an exaggeration though. Like Marsh isn't like editorializing. They literally sing a song. No. A bunch of the lyrics are choking this lady to death, other violent acts. Yes, that's absolutely accurate. The good guys singing about that. I was going to go with best, best kid getting hit in the face with a snowball. Also, just so fucking violently. It's in the first scene. They're doing a big dance number. And out of nowhere, they start having, they're like, oh, and Christmas stuff and snowball fights. And they show a snowball fight happening. And one kid throws a snowball and this other little kid gets hit in the face so badly and he yells. He's like, what the fuck? You hit me in the eye. Ow. Right in the eye. It scratched my fucking cornea and they keep almost what I said. Hey, Christmas trees and sing yeah. song. <laughs> and they just keep going. Christmas trees and snowball fights cuts to the D-Day scene from fucking Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> and, then, and then it cuts back to the musical. Oh, it's so weird, though, because he does. He goes, ow, my eye. And it's like either he just said that because he got really hurt and they left it in. Absolutely got really hurt. Or they put that bit in either. And it's such a weird yeah. choice <laughs> if they put that bit in. Yeah, it's even crazier if they added that. Yes. Yeah. If they were like, hey, what if you go, fuck my eye, right in the middle of that song? And they did that. Either way, ridiculous. 
Can you do good vomit from pain? No? All right. Well, then you just say, <laughs> ow, my eye in the middle of our musical. <laughs> and I wanted to go with best worst phenomenon to have to explain to Marsh. I mean, <laughs> Dolly Parton. Oh, I, I have no idea how of her. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How are we going to explain Dolly Parton to Marsh? It's it, tricky. If only he could relate to his country having a weird old lady who everyone <laughs> in the country seems to admire or like or at least hold some kind of allegiance to. But she doesn't really do anything. And the deeper you look, the less you should like her. Ah, so probably we'll never be able to communicate it. <laughs> is the queen is Queen Elizabeth loved? Is she generally is that like a is everybody a big fan? Um, I think she's broadly tolerated by a lot. Of, so you get the, you get the okay. one group of people who I absolutely love her. And those are the people who are like super hardcore monarchists. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You know, let queen and country till I die kind of thing. And then you get the people, I think more of the people in the country who are like, mm, it's weird that we have a royal family, but at least it's Liz because <laughs> it's going to be Charles. And at that point, the right. monarchy's dead. Because right. the second everybody has to take Charles seriously is the second everyone stops taking the monarchy seriously. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> All right, well, on that note, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back to tell you all about Christmas on the Square. Hi, I'm Eli Posnick. And I'm Heath Enright, here to talk to you about this week's sponsor, Hello Tushy. What's Hello Tushy, you ask? It's a modern bidet attachment that attaches to your existing toilet. There's no electricity or additional plumbing needed, and it cleans your butt with a precise stream of fresh water. All for just $79. And your Hello Tushy will cut toilet paper use by 80%. So it pays for itself simply by how much TP it saves you. But more importantly, imagine if instead of bathing or taking a shower, you just vigorously rubbed your body down with paper towels. You got that image? Got it. Let me just say, Hello Tushy is a whole new level of clean. It sure is, Eli. Plus, every Hello Tushy bidet attachment comes with a 60-day risk-free happy butt guarantee and a 12-month warranty. Get 10% off plus free shipping right now at hellotushy.com slash awful. That's hellotushy.com slash awful for 10% off and free shipping. hellotushy.com slash awful. Did Americans seriously not have affordable bidets until now? We did not. It's mm -mm, revolting. No. Your country never ceases to horrify me. Yeah, wait till you mm -hmm. hear about the sex washcloth. Yeah, I, I don't want to know. Don't you? So, we haven't even gotten the pages yet. Yeah, uh, yeah but I'm sure it's going to be fine. It's Dolly. She's got this. Yeah, yeah, I guess she'll figure it out. Well, hello there, fellas. Holy shit. Oh my god, I'm, I'm calling out. Are you okay? No, no need, no need. This is just how I look. How are you alive? Oh, we're two parts love and one part smoke. Oh, that's adorable. What? Don't put bread crumbs in Mac pudding. <laughs> She's so sassy. Anyway, it's about the songs for Christmas on the Square. Mm, what about them, sugar? Yeah, right. We we haven't got any, and and like we start shooting the movie tomorrow, right? Oh, and there's no problem, sugar. How about this Christmas? Nothing, nothing do to Christmas. Love and tears. Something Christmas. All the love and Christmas through the years. Yeah, I mean, that actually sounds pretty good. Yeah, right. I mean, once the full thing is ready, I guess, you know, yeah. it's, the, it's the beginning of something. What are you talking about, sugar? That was the full thing. Did you say that was the full thing? Mm-hmm. Uh -uh. Christmas something 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 Christmas? That's the final lyrics for a song in this musical? Oh, but most of the song in the musical. What? Dolly, look, with all due respect, right, this is Netflix. And if, if you're going to put out a musical on Netflix, it needs to be at a certain level of... Ah, uh, I think. Y'all don't understand parts of Caddy Wampus. Um... Sorry? Hey, y'all actually listen to one of my songs, The Gibberish. Southern expressions and cutesy half rhymes, story about woman driving through the night, and a man that don't know her no mouth. You can run it with a supercomputer. But my audience is either too young to get or feel bad pointing it out. Because I am Southern, a woman, and I might be this stupid. Did you say possum caddy wampus? Is that what you said? Possum caddy wampus. Uh, okay. Uh, well, um, I, I 
I guess we'll see you on set tomorrow. Bet you bet we thought we will. <laughs> so sassy. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> and we're back. And we're going to start off with about 45 minutes of credits <laughs> with bad crayon drawings of a town square at fucking Christmas time. It's so long. Yeah, not a great sign when your opening credits and music feel like someone making fun of Thomas Kincaid. <laughs> <laughs> The, the whole credits, I initially thought, oh, this must be from like the 70s or so, because he's Dolly Parton and she's been around a long time. Sure. But then I had no idea, I did not realise that it was from this year. Like, in this opening credits, which was this kind of cartoon with the, the, the golden weird font over it, this could have easily blended straight into the closing credits from Cheers and nobody would have noticed, <laughs> nobody would have batted it up. Making you win the world. Yeah, yeah. makes its way through Cheers, wings, out the other side of MASH. And- okay, now it's Take On Me, the music video. Okay, yeah. We're in the 80s at least, that's good. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to open on what Dolly Parton thinks homeless is, gray fur. <laughs> okay. Yeah, <laughs> she's so silly looking. I was like, "Wow, Dolly Parton is in Cats, and I'm excited. <laughs> this is great. She looks like a homeless leopard and is adorable <laughs> all the time. I love her. She's also sparkling. Was I hallucinating this? She was sparkling like she had a side quest for us. It was really off putting. <laughs> well, spoiler: she might or might not have a reason to be sparkling. We'll get to it. <laughs> Dolly Parton looks like if a real doll could starve to death. <laughs> Yeah, so she's panhandling in this town square. There's like the gazebo. It's all Christmassy. I honestly thought they were going to like run into the Gilmore Girls universe. Like (laughs) this felt definitely (laughs) like that place in Connecticut. Yeah. Yeah, same soundstage. And this movie is also going to let us know the quality of music to expect right away. Ooh. Yeah, I had to pause like Rough. a verse into this song to steal myself because I oh I knew it was a musical, but I didn't really consider what that meant. And I literally had to pause and be like, "You can do this." We, we go again. It's it's so violent. Like it just starts out with like slow Christmassy thing, and then all of a sudden there's like like a musical gang runs in and starts doing kicks and flips and everything. It's it's very violent transition and kind of like a an old navy ad. Now, <laughs> <laughs> when the flipping backup dancers showed up, I was like, oh, shit, people are flipping around. This movie had flip money, y'all. Flip money. <laughs> <laughs> this is also very importantly where we meet this movie's Christmas dogs, which are dogs dressed up like elves. And I thought, great. Now the rest of the review is just going to be Heath tearfully defending this movie. <laughs> OK, it was going to be that either way, but they were adorable dogs. <laughs> Ah, oh, but this this opening song, the lyrics are so Great. painful. Like, basically, <laughs> the lyrics are so obvious that, that they sort of double up as audio description for the visually impaired. So at least it's called <laughs> highly for accessibility. It's like, lady walking past the clothes stall, picks up hats and tries them all. It's just say what you see. Ow, you hit me in the eye with a fucking snowball. <laughs> lady on the street at Christmas. Yep, that's where this happens. Real lyric from this song, coats and hats and such as that. <laughs> It's, they might as well have just been like, Lulu, Lu, Lu, you know, winner shit, Lulu. Lu, Lu. <laughs> and of course, our villain is going to show up here and sing about how she has to get out of this town. Yeah. Christine Baranski. How did they get Christine? She's a real actor. She's in <laughs> Sybil. Yeah. Christine Baranski. Sitcom? Or as you might Sybil know Shepherd. her, not Lily Tomlin. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. But yeah, she wants to get out of this town. And safe in the knowledge that this is going to be a musical because that's not a legally protected term. (laughs) It's time to find out Regina, that's Christina Baranski's evil plot, which is that she's going to (laughs) evict the entire town the night before Christmas. Oh, this this whole plot makes no sense. Like you might wonder how she's got the power to evict the entire town, but it turns out she owns the relatively small soundstage that this town is based on. <laughs> <laughs> this Coke commercial set that they rented for a day. Yeah. Yeah, they have no idea how anything with land or selling or property or real estate <laughs> works. But they're convinced that like she's gonna make this entire town literally homeless at like midnight magically. That seems to be the plot. Mm -hmm. We're also going to meet our protagonists here. I have them constantly in my notes as ugly couple, but they are Pastor Christian. Yes, Pastor Christian. And his wife never gets a name. Oh, yeah, she doesn't, does she? No. Adele and Dosaki's guy? 
Yeah. The, the least interesting <laughs> couple in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have them as Aladdin's stepdad and Miss Piggy wished to be a real girl, but sure, sure. <laughs> I, the, but the realism of this ugly couple is really startling, right? Like, you know how sometimes you see an ugly couple and they're ugly in different ways, but somehow it works together? That's these people. They made it into the movie. It's pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> and even like, so we, we come to them and they're in, well, where are they right now? Because if this movie does <laughs> not question. fully understand set design, because he's in very clearly his living room, there's a big tree in the background, there's curtains on the windows and things. She's in a children's clothes store and they're in the same room. That is the same room they're in. I have no idea how that works. Yeah, and they're also talking about how they're getting in vitro fertilization or they're trying for a baby right now. So even if they were going for these people own a living room themed children's clothing store, <laughs> having them sing about their own desire for children makes this scene and setting incredibly confusing. <laughs> yeah. A me like a musical number about the fertility treatments you're getting. Like that could be interesting. They just do it so badly. And wh what were they drinking here? Was, okay. <laughs> so it's, this is their store slash house living room where they have a onesie store. <laughs> There's like one of those old timey glass things of milk or maybe like unpasteurized eggnog or unpasteurized bullshit. And it's yep. just sitting there on the counter and they're talking about <laughs> trying to have a baby. And I was like, maybe don't drink any of that. <laughs> trying to have a child. Uh, it's not just sitting on the counter. It's sitting on the counter in a metal bucket. Why are they <laughs> drinking milk or eggnog from a metal bucket? Is this a thing? <laughs> there wasn't ice in the bucket. It was just a, a bucket. <laughs> to be fair, the only thing grosser than eggnog is eggnog that's been sitting out in the warm air all day. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Christine Baranski comes in to tell them the plot of the movie and they have that weird, awkward re-meeting where they're like, oh, Christine Baranski, we haven't seen you since your dad died. Your dad died. We liked your dad, but then he died. <laughs> Anyways, how are you? Yeah, it's like, I haven't seen you since Backstory. How have you been since Backstory? <laughs> this is also where we meet Christine's bumbling assistant, and she's so awkward. But like, she's beyond awkward. She's unfunctioningly awkward. She doesn't understand <laughs> anything. She can't do anything. She can't even speak. She says, Merry Christian, Pastor Christmas. And we didn't know his name was Christian at this point. We did so not. I was like, what is she just like saying words because he's a priest? Is What is she looking for here? It was so strange. It's it's obvious this actress thought she was too pretty to be funny. So she just agreed to switch around some words. That was as far as she would go. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to cut over to the sassy barbershop where the movie's two gayest backup dancers were told to go nuts. <sighs> and you know what? They did. This was gross. The, the, the movie clearly was like, what are barbershops like and they came up with the stereotypes of a black barbershop and the stereotypes of like what a homophobic person thinks a salon would be and they just <laughs> mashed it up together into this bigot musical mashup it's horrible the two dancers here i think the way they're dancing technically qualifies as a hate crime i think technically you can report them just for this absolutely dancing. correct yeah but this is where we meet the head of the barbershop christine baranski's only friend in the world Margeline. Margeline, yes. Yep. We're just throughout this film, we just pretend Margeline is a name. <laughs> and I was so frustrated by this. I paused and I checked on one of those baby name sites to see how popular a certain name is. And apparently since 1980, there has been one person worldwide listed called Margeline, and uh, she was in Quebec. So that yeah. is that is that is the name. Apparently, we're going with Margeline. And they Margelineized a black woman, which is not great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's phenomenal. So her her only friend, Marjoline, tells her, you shouldn't shut the town down, but she's going to anyway, darn it. And as she does that, she looks in the window of one of the stores to let us know she has backstory. Trust us, she does. <laughs> and the thing is, Marjoline, she doesn't just tell her that. It's important to point out she sings it because obviously so much of the stuff has to be sung. And I get the feeling that they cast the actress who played Marjoline based on her looks in the sense that they thought she looked like she'd have a soulful singing voice and so didn't bother <laughs> checking that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, look, you look like you can sing. You've got that, I don't know what, the, what it is about you, but you look soulful uh, and you look like you'd have a really soulful voice. <laughs> Very possible. God. Yeah, she looks through the window and she has a, a doodly-doo to, to making out with someone. What was this? I think... I, 
I hoped it wasn't a doodly do. I hope she was just looking through the window, like staring at a couple who were kissing. Like I, I really wanted to not be a memory. I just want them to turn around and be like, ah! and just see her staring. What the in. fuck, lady? <laughs> just like aggressively pull the curtains too. Oh, and then I'm sorry. I know this isn't related to the plot of the movie, but they finished the like. Don't Nothing's kick us out related of our to town. the plot of the movie. <laughs> yeah, whatever. That's fair. So everyone meets in the center of town to commiserate musically and to yell at Christine Baranski's car. The doggies get an eviction notice here. So I know Heath is back on board and criticizing this movie. (laughs) And then for no discernible reason, right? They're like, oh, don't kick us out of our houses. Please don't kick us out of our houses. And then for no discernible reason, everything grinds to a halt. And Dolly Parton just sings Christmas on the square. (laughs) She might as well sing Christmas on the square is the name of the movie. Nailed it. I'll be in my trailer. It took so much effort to get there too. Like they had words that rhymed with square and then they forgot to end it on Christmas on the square. They kept going awkwardly and finally they were like, and then remember earlier, air square, Christmas Something square. over there. Something over there. We'll go with that. It's fine. We'll go with that. And right, at this point. Ow, you the she- fucking eye. Sorry. <laughs> end of song. J- just after she finishes saying Christmas on the square, she gets teleported out of the scene. And I thought, right, I think she just got beamed up. And at this point, I developed the theory that she's from the Enterprise. And uh, th- that she, <laughs> the reason she was only observing and not intervening was because of the prime directive. That is, that is a, a theory I'm sticking with. There, there is going to be more evidence coming your way. <laughs> there is. <laughs> we need to get her into a Star Trek movie. That would be Yes. Beautiful. Star Trek, I don't know, what are we on? 13 now with Dolly Parton? Do it. Yes, I'm in. I'm 100% in. All right. So meanwhile, back at the church, Pastor Christian, yes, that's what that character is named, <laughs> is putting up name. signs that say, resist Regina. <sighs> and they talk about how massive this sign is. And that, first of all, it's not that big a sign. I have, I have seen bigger <laughs> signs. I've been seeing bigger signs on smaller buildings than that. But he says, it's such a big sign. I think she can see it from space. And I said, yes, I told you she's from Star Trek. This is making sense. <laughs> Dolly Parton is a Star Trek. That's why she can see it from space. <laughs> also, these people are all about to be homeless. Maybe don't buy signs. I feel like you're just, <laughs> even if it's a small sign. <laughs> and they're talking in the craziest, most stilted way. It's like they used all the lyrics they couldn't quite make rhyme for the lines in the movie. They were like, ah, <laughs> damn it, we ended one with orange again. You know what? It'll just be part of the talky parts. <laughs> and this is where ugly couple get their love duet. But just just before that, I mean, not just is it, they're not just talking stiltedly. He is absolutely slurring his speech. I didn't imagine that, right? I, I was oh. pretty confident at this point he was having a stroke. I was like, quick, check his face, check his arms, check whatever the T stands for in F-A-S-T, the stroke. <laughs> just check him quick. He's doing really badly. I think this actor just sings and they were like, oh, you'll talk a little bit too. And he was like, ah, I just <laughs> sing mostly. So he talks, but at like 10% of human speed. And then he starts singing <laughs> And it's an entirely different voice. It's not even, yeah. it's very jarring when he goes from one to the other. They need, they needed to have him just sing yeah, or just talk, but clearly just sing. Or ideally neither. Yeah, he's ideally either not, yeah, you know what? I like Marsha's right. best. <laughs> he's either dubbed or possessed in this movie. <laughs> I, I think it's it's like when you uh, usually listen to podcasts at like one and a half speed and there's something you really want to hear properly and you're trying to knock it down to normal speed, but you go too far. And it's like, oh, I'm listening to like <laughs> se- like seven tenth speed and this sounds really weird <laughs> now. And he's just that. Yeah. Also, he's a pastor. Should he be using fertility science against God to create a child with his wife? I don't think so. These are these are the great questions. But yeah, this is their love duet. Lyrics written by someone who learned everything they know about love from eighth grade poetry. He also <laughs> calls her his soft pillow uh, at this point in the movie. That was nice. She's a, uh, 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 she's a big girl for that to be a lyric in this movie. <laughs> It does come off a little rough. There's, there's a couple of lines yeah. of this that are brutal. He said, he says to her, what if I told you you're cute? And she sings back, that's a lie, but nice try. And I thought, fuck me, that's brutal. <laughs> wow. Kind of me. Yeah, I mean, she's like thick Adele, not thin Adele, but like good looking, <laughs> good looking thick Adele. I like thick Adele too. Kind of assholes about it. Yeah, but you wouldn't describe Adele as a soft pillow to her face. <laughs> or you shouldn't. But I don't know. Pro tip. You're like memory foam? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and then at the end, this actor who I'm going to go ahead and guess is gay, it barely holds it together pretending he wants to kiss this woman. <laughs> they have a kiss at the end of their love oh. duet. And he's like, mm, yummy. Love to kiss you. Yup. Cut. Oh, cut. So <laughs> uncomfortable through every moment of semi-physical intimacy throughout this entire film. It is it is excruciating to watch. Did you guys not know we're brother and sister? You cast us as husband and wife. I didn't think. <laughs> All right, we'll do it. I can't talk and I'm going to be kissing my sister. That's fine. I also had a mild obsession that I started developing at this point, which is just watching what everyone's doing in the background of the scene where they're trying to like go around doing town stuff, but they're really bad. So they're either really massively overacted. Like at this moment, you've got the mailman who's, he's, they're all packaging, uh, the whole town basically is packaging massive boxes of flyers into the mail van so they can go tell the whole town that there's a meeting and the whole town is definitely there. It's like, is there anyone in this town who doesn't know what's happening? They're all currently in the square putting together the flyers <laughs> to go and tell themselves. It's so strange. Yeah. And, and mailing them seems like the worst plan. Yeah. Uh, so meanwhile, yeah. Regina's back at home looking out over Whoville. <laughs> <laughs> they actually had an opportunity to do a great Grinch thing in like a, another minute. They, they show Christine Baranski and she's having like a face mask put on and it's all green and they could have done that like Grinch smiley thing with the thing. Nope, they totally missed it. Yeah. But she's definitely the Grinch. I wanted also at this point, it made me think of Jessica Walters from <laughs> Arrested Development. Lucy, Lucy <laughs> Bluth. I wanted so bad for a Jessica Walters character to be like, even richer lady who evicts Christine Baranski somehow. <laughs> Kicks her out of her mansion. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, the point of this scene is that she's missed a call from her doctor, which is movie for you're dying. Yes. Yeah. And then we've got Marjorie who comes to like a house call, uh, like for a beauty appointment. And it's like Marjorie is doing house calls as well as running a busy salon. And I, I think that's because she's got to work all the hours God sends her so she can afford to pay her backing dancers slash gay hype men. <laughs> yep, absolutely. <laughs> so I, don't know, I don't know why we keep those guys around. And, and this is where she sings the like, <laughs> you shouldn't sell the town and you're not going to have any friends if you do this song which is like I, I think it's supposed to be sassy comedy but none of it really works one of the lyrics is I'll tell you where to stick it if it isn't where I think it should go mm -hmm. and I just wrote in my notes what could this lyric be about besides anal sex that's not a double <laughs> entendre it's just a tundra you want to put milk in between my cookies I don't understand <laughs> is this a Christmassy thing still <laughs> also the, the line leading into this song the cue line is you're going to die ba -dam, ba -dam, ba -dam. So, Jesus <laughs> yes, Christ is. That, is, that is busy work yeah I mean the, the title of the song is something like God's gonna murder you right yeah. like that's what the, that's what was being sung and also I believe there was a whole movement to this song that was listen to your magic black friend right mm -hmm. yeah th th that's what she's doing she's singing that and she is literally the magical black friend. She is the first of the magical black friends. We will meet a second magical black friend <laughs> later in the in the, the film. marginally marginally nice <laughs> magical <laughs> black friend. Yeah. <laughs> this is also where we will learn that Marjoline was the first female mayor of town. Lead with that. Lead with that on your resume. And then she went back to hairdresser. <laughs> but she says, I I you know, I opened the first female owned salon in this town. And I was the first female mayor. So you've got those the wrong way around. Leave it the mayor <laughs> thing. It's much more impressive. <laughs> right. But her whole plan here, Marjoline, is to like pretend she's doing Christine Baranski's hair, but then not do it at the end for spite. Right? Yeah. yeah. Just, just mess her back up right at the last minute. Right. But she doesn't do that, really. Like, if that's your plan... You take a giant swipe with a buzzer down the middle of the head, right? And then, like, for the rest of the movie, Christine Bransky has, like, a big gap or something. <laughs> that would have been funny. <laughs> I feel like they pitched that and Christine Bransky said no. And beat the <laughs> fuck out of somebody that tried to do it. Yeah. Oh, there's also a line in here. And you know, maybe this is a cultural thing. Maybe this is something that makes no sense to we naive Brits. But she says, <laughs> you know, there's a saying, you can't be too rich or too thin. Is is that yeah. a saying? Who says that? <laughs> rich, thin people? Oh, you you non You can Jews. definitely be too thin, but too rich. <laughs> you absolutely can. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's the thing that old Jewish women say before they have a salad without dressing on it. It's, it's a thing. Trust me. Oh, is it? Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
Right. So <laughs> now it's time for Regina, now that she's had her sassy, magical black friend tell her what to do, it's time for her to meet with Carl, her ex-boyfriend at... Okay, what the fuck is this store that he works at? This movie's impossible to describe. It's just a Christmas store. It's a <laughs> store of Christmas bullshit. Yeah, I mean, when you first see it, it looks like the town's, you know, thriving old wooden toy store. <laughs> we later find out the origin story of those toys, and that just improves <laughs> it so much. It's real sad. Are it's rough. dark. Yeah, my first note is, he just sells old country buffet shit? Like, resell? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. It's like the gift shop at, at a Cracker Barrel, but just for Christmas bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> so Christine Bransky explains this, Tim, too. She's like, I'm evicting you, but I'm like buying, you're, you're getting paid off to leave. You own a Christmas store. This is a great deal <laughs> if I give you a dollar. <laughs> and then she acts, this is my favorite line in the movie. She goes, look at your fucking store. It's full of broken dreams. <laughs> and I was so happy. Yeah, she says, this isn't a general store. And it's like, yeah, it isn't a general store. Like I'm pretty. <laughs> this is just the strangest store I've ever seen. Like, I'm no. pretty sure there's a mugwai for sale in the corner of the room. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very it's strange a specific store. store. Really stupid <laughs> niche specific. It's niche. The store. You're, how do you make money here? Is that loose candy in jars? You can't be making money. <laughs> and it, it is a very niche store because it turns out seemingly everything he sells in there is from dead kids because he's talking about look at this he sings a song and it's like look at this tea set the girl who gave who i got this from used to play with this with her dad and then she took ill and her little bald head still sticks in my mind today that little bald head is an amazing line for this song her dad's broken dreams okay yeah the implications of this are fucking nuts right which is that like oh yeah no that little girl she got cancer she died and then i was like I'll give you four bucks for her tea set. And now it's here in my <laughs> store and I'll sell it to a stranger for five. Yeah. After I tell the stranger where it, where it came from <laughs> and the tragic death of the previous owner. That's a creepy train. He goes to like estate sales, like somebody owns a record store, but buying dead kids toys. That's <laughs> insane. So dead kids toys and also lamps from his former girlfriend's father just so he can find out more information on his former girlfriend. <laughs> like, apparently he kept buying things yeah. off her dad so he could keep in touch with what she was doing. And that is red flag behavior. That is absolutely red flag behavior. He's supposed to be a good guy. That's terrifying. Correct. <laughs> no, I need this opened box of tissues. So does she ever leave any of her shoes here? <laughs> ah, stupid, stupid. Don't worry about it. <laughs> And this is also where he's like, come on, don't you remember the memories? And because Christine Baranski has to hint at her dark backstory, she goes, I have different memories than you. <laughs> Were you going to explain in song the rest of that? Or are we just, no? no okay. It's just my memories are not the same as yours. Like, yeah, that's, that's how memories work. <laughs> that's how memories work. That's everybody. Oh. You're weird. And then he, he just keeps, she leaves. She leaves. She leaves. Mm -hmm. And Carl keeps singing to himself for way too long. <laughs> yeah. And like, he's definitely had that. She left me and fucked up my life song up his sleeve for years. He's been doing that song to himself for years. <laughs> I have just the lyrics for this moment. Yeah. So with that weird solo done, Regina gets back into her car, which comedy is covered in flyers. Oh, and we hear, this is this is a really small moment, but it just shows you how badly made this film is. We hear the protesters who are protesting and resisting Regina, and they're doing that, hey, hey, ho, ho, Regina's got to go chant. Right. But they can't get that chant right, because they go, <laughs> hey, hey, ho, ho, Regina's got to go. That is not how that chant works. That is not how you do a chant. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, well, that is... Far from the worst they do with trying to get syllables and rhyme and <laughs> meter correctly. <laughs> that was like one of their better jobs, to be honest. Uh, and Dolly Parton shows up again to bother her some more. Yeah. She's like, hey, you shouldn't litter. Because she's taking all the posters off her car. And she's like, hey, you shouldn't litter. She specifically says, it's not nice <laughs> to litter the earth, which is a really weird way of phrasing that for anyone who isn't a Star Trek. But this is more proof <laughs> that she is a Star Trek. Again. Again. But Regina's just like, you're a homeless leopard. Go the fuck away. <laughs> and this is where we find out why Marsh noticed that Dolly Parton was sparkling earlier. She was. She is magical somehow. Mm -hmm. She's magic. And she's she's going to, well, what she specifically says as the homeless lady who's been asking everyone for change, she said, I'm going to get change out of you one way or the other. 
which is a really, really intimidating line to hear from a homeless person. You don't need, I mean, I, <laughs> lots of people can end up homeless for lots of different reasons, but if any one of them ever says to you, I'm going to get change out of you one way or another, you run. You just yeah. run. You're, you're at the beginning of an episode of Inside Number 9, and it's yeah. not going to work out well for you. Especially if you have change inside of you, because it's coming out. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, just as Christine Baranski is driving away, she uh, almost runs over her doctor, who's like, hey, we need to talk. Psst. <laughs> You're dying. Psst, psst. It's a weird moment. Yeah, the doctor is uh, played by James von Prague, dressed as uh, Geraldo Rivera. That's what I had in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a ridiculous moment. The doctor is like, Regina, Regina, you have can't, or d you do or don't have cancer, <laughs> public square. I want to talk to you about cancer and you. <laughs> Don't worry, I covered it up real good. <laughs> but she's going to go get a test at the hospital and she'll talk to him later. And the only reason I point that out is afterwards. So she talks to Dolly Parton, who's like, I'm going to squeeze change out of your butthole. And she's like, go away, old lady. And then the doctor's like, you might or might not have cancer. And then as she's driving away, Dolly Parton's in her real view mirror, giving her finger guns like, see, <laughs> brain tumor. Gotcha. Dolly Parton. It's, it's that intimidating, like point to the eyes, point to your eyes. I'm watching you kind of thing. And I'll, I'll be honest, I've clipped that. I've got that as a gift. That's going to be my gift reaction to 90% of things that happen in my life from now on. <laughs> All right. Well, I think a magical homeless leopard lady just gave somebody cancer for spite. <laughs> so great time to take a break. Then we'll be back with more Christmas on the square. Oh, ho, 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 hey, ho, ho. Santa, what's the matter? Oh, hey, Jingles. Santa's just a little sad this year. He's really getting it on his cell phone bill, if you know what I mean. Yar? Oh, yeah. Up here at the North Pole, my cell phone bill is so high, they're putting milk right in between my cookies. Well, why don't you just try Mint Mobile? What's Mint Mobile? They're the first company to sell premium wireless service online only. Mint Mobile lets you safely order from home and maximize your savings with plans starting at just $15 a month. I've been using Mint Mobile long before this holiday deal, and I gotta say, it's the perfect time to switch. Wait, $15 a month? You're jingling my bells. No, I am not doing that. Right now, when you switch to Mint Mobile and buy any three-month plan, you'll get another three months for free. Wow, that's literally hundreds of dollars in savings, but does it work? It sure does. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Five Gs? That's faster than blitzing over Baghdad. That's right. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their seven-day money-back guarantee. We actually really did switch to Mint Mobile, and we are never switching back. Well, I'm sold. What's that deal I get again? For a limited time, buy any three-month Mint Mobile plan and get three more months free by going to mintmobile.com slash gam. That's mintmobile.com slash G-A-M. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash gam. You've saved Christmas, Jingles. Glad to hear it. Now, uh, about that elf union I was You're talking fired. about. Okay. Oh, Regina, Regina, hey, Regina. What is it, doctor? I'm very busy. Yeah, uh, I called your home, but nobody was there. So uh, I'm going to tell you now, it's about your test results. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Doctor, very busy. Spit it out. Oh, uh, okay. I just think I. it's probably better if maybe we talk like... Uh, uh, hello, Regina. Oh, Dr. Smith, you remember my business partner, Dave Walneck? Oh, uh, hi, Dave. He was just giving me my test results. Doctor, those uh, test well, results. Yeah, the, uh, like I was saying, I think it's better maybe if we don't, oh, don't do it. Oh, come now, sir. Me and Mr. Walnack have business to do. Don't waste our time. Yes, we've got contracts to sign and leases to lean, man. Come on. Really? Now! Now! <sighs> okay. Um, You did, in fact, get AIDS from that glory hole. Oh, I see. Yeah. Is that the one in the park bathroom or the one in the adult bookstore? Park. Oh, uh, yeah, that'll happen. <laughs> And we're back. 
And evil rich lady Regina is back home looking at her town selling contract, which which is like 5,000 pages. It's just comedically long. Do they print the whole thing out like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have no idea anything about how anything property works. Again, it's it's nonsense. And we also have her assistant, her personal assistant. What's her name? Felicity? Felicity, yeah, yep. yeah. Felicity, her assistant is there. And Felicity's like, hey, maybe... The giant mall can go somewhere else. And she's like, fuck your face. I'm still the evil character. Great. <laughs> it's only act two, damn it. Act two. <laughs> but that, that, for one thing, Felicity suggests they build a mall somewhere people don't live, which isn't really a good business plan to build a massive mall <laughs> where there's nobody go to it. But even then, like, it's, she said, oh no, there's going to be a mall the size of the town square. But we've seen the town square. It's not that big. It's not mall sized. It's like maybe <laughs> very large supermarket big, but it's not mall big. Kiosk yeah. size. <laughs> yeah. No one, yeah. There's no one near big enough. Also, just in case anybody didn't spot, the uh, the mall was called Cheetah Mall. Che- <laughs> Cheetah cheat- 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 Mall. Cheetah Mall. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't catch that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. There's something later where I was like, Oh, they just set this up. They called it Cheetah Mall just for this other rhyme that they do. But it wasn't Cheetah Mall, like Dewey, Cheetah, and Howe. That's mm. Marsha's smarter than me. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this movie grows on Heath every second. That's an excellent pun. That's <laughs> very good gonna, play. Yeah, just, yeah, just watch it 30 times. You'll get Easter eggs like this. That's the thing about this. Uh, <laughs> Patreon goal, Heath will watch this movie 30 times. <laughs> it is $1 above our current Patreon amount. So yeah, everyone just uh, get that in there. And this is where Dolly's going to visit Christine Baranski as a full-on angel. Well, it's confusing <laughs> because Dolly Parton just shows up in your house magically. And Christine Baranski very reasonably is like, hello, homeless angel on her wedding day? What the fuck is happening? <laughs> I'm calling the cops. Yeah, she thinks she's kidnapping her. But like, do kidnappers often materialize in front of you in your house riding on a cloud? Because that's what happens. She's looking <laughs> right. at the door frame and Dolly Parton suddenly appears floating on a cloud. And that's not your average MO for a kidnapper. <laughs> Which, to, my, to my knowledge. When she sees her, she pushes a button on her desk and she's like, I've just called the police. <laughs> yeah, but right, sorry. Was that button actually there and or, and and did Dolly change it with angel magic? Or was it genuinely just a throat lozenge that Christine put a finger on and bluffed it as being the alarm? Because that is <laughs> yes. a hell of a bull bluff. That is a bull bluff. Do you see a, a stray throat lozenge? Good question. Yeah. I feel like if in real life Dolly Parton visited me and I wanted to, to do a bluff about a throat lozenge being a magical button, I could and she would not know. <laughs> but it's not clear here. But this is where Dolly Parton explains that Christine Bransky may have atheism cancer, right? <laughs> <laughs> she has she has atheism cancer, and she, Dolly Parton, is her angel named angel there to help her. Oh God. <sighs> yeah. She starts singing. <laughs> Christine Bransky's like, all right, just checking WebMD. Does cancer cause musicals no <laughs> so yeah dolly sings the i'm an angel song and this is also where we get the parable of the lamplighter the, the scottish the scottish parable of the lamplighter it's one of those many scottish parables you know scotland's really famous for its parables okay yeah. what? it's not like a welsh fable it's a scottish parable. <laughs> what is it though because she sings a long ass song and as far as i know it's just a guy lights lamps. Yes. How is that a parable? So that's the best part. Dolly Parton is so stupid that she was like, once there was a lamp lighter, he lit lamps. Are you still with me? You still with me? Yeah. This one took me like nine ones to get. No, I, I got it. Is there more song? That is pretty much the parable of the lamp lighter. I had to look it up and I'll tell you what the payoff is in a second, but... I walked away from this scene being like, is the parable of the lamplighter one time a Scottish guy had a job? Because that yes. feels <laughs> I think it is. Feels political. Okay. <laughs> so a lamplighter lights the lamps, right? And eventually you could see where he'd been because that's where the lamps were lit. I should point out, very importantly, that is where the song ends, okay? Where mm. the parable <laughs> ends is there should be no better goal in life than for people to know where you've been than the light that you've shown while you were there. 
Oh, okay. So, okay. This is, they did not include that in the song. But that's the opposite of how lamps work. Like if you light a candle or a lamp, they go out eventually. That's not how that, if he's a lighter, he clearly it goes, it's his job to go back. They fucked up the whole metaphor. So th this was a, a poem by Robert Louis Stevenson, I think. Yeah. I, I looked this up and that's the only thing I Wait, could find. really? That's that's not a parable. That's a poem. Does Dolly Parton not know the difference? <laughs> Absolutely. As we will learn later on, she doesn't know the difference between a Bible and a birth certificate. So she's going to get... <laughs> yeah. Good point. The things... <laughs> At least while she's telling us the parable, we do get to see an extra from Mary Poppins chim chimming his way through the street like this. <laughs> Wanted him to fall to the ground, start foaming at the mouth. Nope, meth addict, not a lamplighter. <laughs> also, oh, Dolly is floating on this cloud while she's singing. But obviously, you know, this is kind of a, uh, one of those kind of green screen things going on. But it looks exactly like when parents buy those videos that Photoshop their baby into a scene. It's like the next <laughs> scene is going to be like Dolly Parton sledding down a hill with Santa. It's, that's, that's definitely the next scene. <laughs> or Morgan Fairchild and their tech vests from Old Navy. Like it was, it, everything brought me back to that. That constantly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So now we're going to cut back to the townspeople and they are recitativing. <laughs> we teased this earlier when we talked about how they were all going to have a big town meeting where they decided to be violent to her. That's this song. Yeah. 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 And there's a point where they talk about how the town, oh, it knows everything about us. It knows all of our fingers and toes, which is <laughs> a weird line to have about your town. Uh, it's creepy. And then you got the doctor saying, this is the town where we got mumps, measles and rubella. And I was like, oh, great. This is a town full of anti-vaxxers. And they're bragging about getting mumps and measles. Fantastic. <laughs> well, but this doctor is one line away from talking about natural herd immunity. Just one line away. From <laughs> it's a town of cast members during 2020 who filmed a fucking movie together. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. If you're wondering the quality of lyrics, the chorus of this is she's the wicked witch of the middle. She steals mm. our homes and vittles. Wait, it was vittles? Vittles, I yeah. thought it was fiddles. And I was like, <laughs> they all had fiddles? Well, I thought it was like she steals and fiddles, as in like sort of, you know, fiddles the books kind of thing. <laughs> oh. But I had to put the, the subtitles on and it was vittles. And what the fuck? I, I thought, so hang on, so she's stealing and vittling? Those are two things she's doing. She steals and she vittles? <laughs> Also, she, she's the Wicked Witch in the middle. They just all agree on this, but I was like, what the fuck does that mean? The middle, why is she the middle? Why is she the middle of what? And we do find that out, but not for ages. It takes them like a half hour to come up with the answer, which is middle of the country, right? Yes. Yeah. They're in Kansas, apparently. Yeah, there will literally be an entire other scene in between them singing that line for the first time and explaining that fucking line, <laughs> right? Because later on, they'll be like, well, there was the Wicked Witch of the East and there was the Wicked Witch of the West. She's the Wicked Witch of the Middle. This is the best Ellie Parton could do on her lunch break. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, the only reason I put two and two together about them being in the middle of America is because I noticed on one of the car's number plates, it said Kansas. And I Googled to see exactly geographically where Kansas was mm -hmm. and realized, oh, that's the, the exact middle of America. It is that now middle. makes sense. I had to do that level of sleuthing to decode this <laughs> fucking lyric. <laughs> yeah, and this is, whose best worst was this? Where everybody's crazy fucking vibe. Yeah, this is Marshall's yeah. best worst. This whole song is just people inside of a church, the good guys being like, in song, what if we murder this woman with an ax? What if we literally poison her to death? A little girl gets up and is like, poison her? And everybody's like, yeah, it's pretty good. Poison. Poison. Okay, <laughs> write it on the board. <laughs> There's no bad answers. Is no, what the, no, answer, no, no right. bad ideas. <laughs> And I thought, is this is this what happens in films just before the scene you normally cut to, which is the pitchfork mob with torches? This is what happens in every single one of those films. Like Frankenstein, it's there. They just cut it normally. <laughs> All right. So now we cut out. So while they're planning her death, we cut over to Regina's car where she is hallucinating Dolly Parton again. And Dolly's telling her not to go to the town meeting. Yeah, she says, Dolly's saying, leave those poor people alone to sing about choking you to death. Just leave those <laughs> poor people to that. <laughs> so this is where they explain the Wicked Witch of the Middle thing. They sing a little bit more of the Wicked Witch of the Middle thing. And at this point, my notes were just, hey, guys, is writing songs hard? This movie makes it seem like writing songs <laughs> is super hard. 
Listen, Viddle, it's hard to come up with stuff that rhymes. We had, we wanted to use Viddle and Middle, we, we worked it in. Shut up. Oh, but even when they find a simple rhyme, they can't connect it to the plot in even the most basic way. Like they call her a hag and then they say, all she does is boast and brag. Two things we have not seen her do at any point. And it would have been really easy to just throw that into her character to make the rhyme work. But no. No, but she she shows up at the meeting anyways and tells them that it's time for this town to enter the 21st century. You know, <laughs> like they can work at lids. <laughs> <laughs> she does show up and it's it's kind of like the worst version of that thing where you're talking about someone and they're right behind you. It's that, but for the entire town. It's, oh, yeah. she, she's in the room, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and she explains to them again that their town's fucking stupid. Everything's like a Christmas onesie store. That's ridiculous. We're obviously doing the mall thing. Oh, and this is where they explain the cheetah mall, cheat us mm-hmm. all. The guy sings it in in a lyric. Yeah, they hilariously make this pun obvious by going like, you know, you're just using cheetah mall to cheetah mall. I think I said the same thing twice there. Can we go again? Technically <laughs> rhymes with A rhymes with A. Don't be an asshole. We're <laughs> doing the best we can. The whole time though, every time they're singing in this church or any of the buildings, all I wanted was a wrecking ball to just smash right and start creating the mall. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never stop our spoosh. Oh, beep, God. Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> exactly. Sn- Snowball kid comes in and stands near the window. Okay, I'm feeling a lot smashed. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, now that the town is done arguing as well as Rudy Giuliani, she leaves and they sing the saddest dream a happy try song. I've ever, f- this is mm. fucking insane. Oh my God. The actual lyric from this try a try song. Try each day to try a little higher. And if you fail, <laughs> get up and try again. <laughs> I just wrote in my notes, I'll kill myself on this fucking podcast. I'm Bud Dwyer. <laughs> Oh, it, this is not an inspirational. It's like the song, a song about trying a bit is not a deep inspirational <laughs> song. No matter how many times you include lines like, Dreams are of no value if they're not equipped with wings. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Secure yourself for climbing. Try to be the first one at the mountain. What? What do you do? Why is it? No. Yeah. If a burgundy ribbon was a town, it's this town. It's <laughs> so bad. They're singing about like defeating capitalism with their gumption and trying. And it's so fucking sad. Meanwhile, all of them voted for pro-business Republicans in Kansas. Sure. <laughs> Fuck yourself. <laughs> The next scene, they all vote for Christine Baranski, even though she's (laughs) destroying their town. Also, this is maybe too niche, but if you're a theater person long enough, eventually you get invited to a party at an older theater person's house, right? Someone who's done theater their whole life. And that party inevitably turns into old people singing show tunes and it fucking sucks. I love those. That's what this movie is like. This movie is like three hours into your mom's aunt's best friend's party. Luck be a lady tonight. Stop it. Come on, man. I'm convinced now that's the origin story for this film. That's why it all feels so hastily put together. They just recorded that and went, yeah, I think we've got the script, guys. We'll uh, we'll just crack on with it. <laughs> oh, God. Also, like, because it's in a church, we see people in a church and they start like touching each other's hands and st- like standing really close to one another and singing loudly into each other's faces. And where is COVID-19 when you need it? Like that would have been the hero <laughs> of this film if COVID-19 <laughs> just swept through the town. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So... Now we're back outside and Regina can't find her keys, darn it. So she's going to pull a Heath Enright and go get drunk at a bar. <laughs> okay, that's not, that's a reasonable, that's not just me, a lot of whatever. A lot of people get a nice <laughs> buzz going before they drive home. And the thing is, surely this pub should be closed because literally everybody in the town is currently at a meeting singing about how they want to kill you. <laughs> and I, I, I initially had in my notes... Who's even going to be there to run this pub? And Great I question, should not Marsh. have asked that question. Great question. If you were thinking 10-year-old child mm-hmm. as the bartender <laughs> and proprietor of this bar, you were correct. Yeah. Yeah. Sassy baby black girl who is fucking fantastic in so many ways. She's great. Yes. Mm-hmm. The best way of which is that they obviously wrote for her to speak in, you know, like a uh, let's say, an urban vernacular. However, 
That's not how this actress speaks. That's definitely not what it said in parentheses in the notes either. <laughs> no, that's not <laughs> what it said in the notes. Dolly Parton managed to write blackerer and they were like, okay, all right. Because <laughs> this little girl will be like, hey, welcome to our bar. I show am a diva. Mm, mm, mm. <sighs> I yep. did like it when she she led with that, and then she was like, "And by the way, fucking tip." tip me. <laughs> I was like, "All right, I'm on your team." Yeah, and this little girl proves right away that she's a legit bartender because she does the shittiest, stingiest pour. I was like, "Yeah, that's a bartender." <laughs> Lines the bottom of the glass with some scotch and charges her eighteen dollars. That's my girl. <laughs> Wait, I I thought that looked like quite a lot of whiskey to be having in a glass. That yeah, was like it's a, a pretty solid pour. Glass. Eli doesn't drink whiskey neat. <laughs> I was like, that is a very heavy-handed seven-year-old right there. <laughs> and also, like I alluded to it earlier, but like, this kid is super precautious because she is the youngest magical black lady in all of Christian cinema. <laughs> <laughs> she's on a fast track program. Yeah, she's like magical black lady at like a seventh grade level. She's way ahead of herself. <laughs> and they're gonna say she likes Christine Baranski, and Christine Baranski likes her because they're an old white lady and a small black child, and Lord knows those people get along. <laughs> So they're going to sing a Life is Not a Fairy Tale duet? Yep. Mm -hmm. And can I just throw out there, you shouldn't have a fairy tales or stupid song if your movie has Dolly Parton as an angel named Angel. You got to pick a side of cynicism movie, okay? Yeah, that is, it's, it's a bit rich is what you can say about it. It's a little bit rich. And there's a lovely line in the song as well where they say, you know, this isn't a tale for elves and fairies. And I thought, does does Dolly Parton think fairy tales are tales for fairies? <laughs> but yeah, this is also where the little girl's going to reveal her tragic backstory because mm -hmm. she says like, oh, my dad always talks about the mean witch of the middle. And she's like, oh yeah, why doesn't he like her? And she's like, well, she killed my mother. Mm. Stay with me, Dolly Parton movie. Her mother, so Christine Baranski, shut down the drugstore in town, which based on the businesses we saw so far was Christmas themed, which meant that when she got a fever as a child, her mom had to drive far away to go get her medicine and crash the car and explicit line drowned. She didn't mm. just die in a car crash. She crashed her car yeah. and drowned. <laughs> It's so much extra stuff. The song is like the problem of evil, the song. And it's very confusing <laughs> for the theme of the movie. There's an angel played yeah, by Dolly Parton in it. This, this kid's backstory, therefore, is basically you killed my mum via a Rube Goldberg machine. That's, that's how it's <laughs> yeah, You caught that mouse because you turned the crank and, and everything else happened after that. There was a, there was a boot. It was going downhill. <laughs> End of story. Mouse caught. And then the little girl has this moment where she's like, you know, I don't blame the witch because if I had never had a fever and okay, here's what's supposed to happen. Christine Baranski is supposed to say, no, don't blame yourself. Yes. However, they couldn't get the rights to the sentence. Don't blame yourself. <laughs> so Christine Baranski is just like, no, yeah, like no. she's scolding a dog. <laughs> no, bad magical black child. Bad magical black child. Uh, there's also a bit as well where the kid points out, like, you know, my dad calls her the wickedest witch of the middle. Well, he doesn't say witch with a W, but they're implying bitch, right? Yeah. And if so, wickedest bitch of the middle isn't even a, a reference to the Wizard of Oz. It's just a misogynistic insult. <laughs> Oh. One other thing as well that has to be pointed out, she goes to pay for the drink and the kid says, no, my dad says the first drink for anyone is on, no, the first visit to the bar is on the house. That's how you grow a business. And if that's the level of financial ecumen this town has, <laughs> there is no explanation needed for why she needs to fish them all out of the fucking drink, why she needs to be there to solve all the problems, because everybody is an idiot when it comes to business We're sense. We're not making any money. In it. We need lanterns in the bar, maybe? I don't know. Magical lantern. Camera pans over to Heath. Technically haven't left yet. <laughs> More peanuts. More. And then the little girl does side work for a second and it made me very happy. She refills the salt shakers and starts like <laughs> marrying ketchups and shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so now we cut back to Regina's house and she's remembering when her dad used to rub one out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So this sort of explains what I was just referring to with the lanterns. We get a flashback to dad 
inventing a lantern or something like that. And and it's hmm. very he so he's the owner of the town originally before Christine Baranski. And he's got lamps going and lanterns going. And he's like, these lanterns are gonna make this town's economy go crazy. They're everybody's <laughs> gonna move here. And she's like, as a 10-year-old girl, she, in the flashback, she's like, that's fucking stupid, man. Don't will me this town. I don't want it. It's yeah. going to be dumb. But he, he thought that town square would be booming with, quote, businesses from every state. And instead, he got a stereotype salon, the dead girl's toy store, and a bar run by a literal child. Like, this town was his failure first. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, she's done flashing back about that lamp. So we cut to the next morning where Felicia is humming and filling the fridge because it's about to get real weird with her plot line, folks. It's about to get <laughs> real, is. real weird. And in my notes, I've got uh, Lou, Lou, Lou putting weird condiments and stuff. Putting weird <laughs> condiments and stuff is my favorite stuff. Okay, so this is where Dolly Parton appears to Felicia. And we learn that Felicia is not a personal assistant or possible lesbian lover because she lives there. <laughs> She's okay. an angel. That's, you thought she was fucking Christine Baranski for a absolutely, while. For the, until now, absolutely. Right? Yeah. But you okay. know, <laughs> the point where Christine tells her to go away and instead of leaving Christine's house, she goes upstairs, presumably to her room. Yeah. They, they, were, they were at the very least cohabiting. It could be both. Right. But we learned, yeah, Felicity is an angel in training by Dolly Parton. Mm. Yes. And, and, <laughs> And we learn about the rule book that they have. Yes. Which is interesting. I had so many questions here. So like, okay, Felicity is an angel of training. So is is she dead then? And if so, how did she die? And and how long has she been <laughs> Christine's assistant? And yes. Was she assistant when they drowned the bar girl's mum? And did she not as an angel <laughs> want to try and step in there? And why is Felicity the angel in training called Felicity when the angel is just called angel? Will she have to change her name when she becomes an angel? Is that how that works? There's so many questions. <laughs> Yeah, it feels like at least a medium long con here where they kill the girl's mom and then she like endears herself as this real human assistant who's actually an angel in training. <laughs> at least that much had to happen. It's a weird mm -hmm. plot. And we also learn um, one of the rules in the rule book here, which was strange. Rule number 14, subsection something something. The rule is you have to get the atheist human you're dealing with to change their heart and become a Christian or you get fired and you're not an angel. <laughs> Seems weird that that's the fifth subsection of the 14th rule. Like I needed to know the first 13 <laughs> rules and four subsections. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what are they getting out of the way before they get to that? Yeah. I mean, it's rule number one. How do you think? Right. Whatever. But they're going to sing the you've got to learn how to be an angel duet, which is just everything Dolly Parton thinks normal activities are, which is fascinating right They're, they do a little ballet and Dolly Parton obviously thinks ballet is just spin in a circle spin in a circle spin in a circle she puts her in a cookie jar at one point the, the world through Dolly Parton tinted glasses ladies and gentlemen that's this musical number it is but like when they, we cut to kind of the ballet scene and we have Dolly Parton seemingly controlling Felicity's body like against her will she's got like a look of panic in her eye as, the, as she's making a spin and fair enough the actress playing Felicity can dance here but it seems creepy first of all that Dolly can just take full bodily control over her against her will and then later she imprisons her in a tiny glass box and it's like Dolly has some really creepy angel powers that are not being addressed and <laughs> is, is there it's like an HR department in heaven because there's definitely some weird line manager stuff going on here yeah absolutely no question <laughs> She needs to get v would <laughs> But yeah, with that established, that she is an angel in training and that her mission is to change Christine Baranski's heart and then her heart will change her mind, she's going to drive Christine Baranski to her medical tests for her foreshadowing cancer from earlier <laughs> in the movie. Yeah, and, and Dolly appears to her and she says, oh, no, not again. Why won't you leave me alone? And I wrote my notes. Funny, that's what I say every time I get my GAM invite every month. That's the first thing I try to on each time. <laughs> Come on, this was delightful. You're, you're telling me you weren't charmed by Dolly Parton while you were watching this? I, you didn't love this? I absolutely this? was. And I feel really bad every time we say anything mean about Dolly because yes, she is an international delightful. treasure. She is a global treasure. She cured I have a question about Dolly Parton in this scene. They are talking and then Dolly Parton goes... Ah, oh, man, now I want some fucking cake. And then she vanishes. Yeah. 
Does Dolly Parton's character get distracted by cake and vanish from the scene? Yes. Okay. No. So did I. No, that's Dolly Parton. That's Dolly Parton, the actress who got bored in that scene and left. For cake. No question. No question. <laughs> Dolly Parton was like bored of the movie now. Squip, quit, squib it. Well, poof. And they were like, <laughs> "Yeah, we'll just make her angel disappear." I guess. Same thing happened to Heath, the podcaster. I was like, "Yeah, you know what? I have leftover pie from uh, pumpkin pie, pecan pie. I'm getting some." I would like some pie, Dolly Parton. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this is where she's going to drive through her doodly doos, right? The assistant points out the window. She's like, so how is it being home? Fun. And Christine Baranski looks out the window and she's like, you see that tree? I got fucked super hard under that tree. <laughs> super fucking hard. Difficulty walking hard. You hear me? Yeah. By the collector of dead girls things, specifically by him. <laughs> but this is going to be her. Dark backstory. See, when she was a young lady, she went to the town's sock hop. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's unclear what year this is supposed to be or how old they want Christine Baranski to be. Absolutely no idea. Absolutely no idea how old this is meant to be. It's confusing. She went, to the, this is her high school, right? We flash mm -hmm. back to her high school. She went to the high school from fame, apparently, in <laughs> some year. And everybody at the high school is approximately 40 years old. <laughs> And they're really good at dancing. And she's at yep. the Christmas sock hop for her terrifying backstory that they're about to tell us. And, and part of her terrifying backstory is how much of a controlling dick her dad was. He, he didn't let me date boys. He didn't let me go to the dance. He did this, he did that. And it's like, who'd have thought that a man could be so controlling and a bit of a dick when we've learned that this is a man who stands every night watching over the town and the people he owns from his mansion <laughs> on the hill. Who'd have thought he'd be a bit of a control freak? No, that guy <laughs> didn't turn out to be awesome. But yeah. <laughs> Her backstory is she was dating useless store guy when he was young. Carl. And he saw Carl and she saw him give a girl a ring in the coat room. So she ran away and fucked another dude without asking any questions <laughs> in any way, shape or form. She fucked a very old DJ from Ibiza who was at this <laughs> high school dance, which was yes, kind of disturbing. He's so creepy. He's wearing like a, a really weirdly tight woolen shirt, sort of split almost to the navel. And he dances in the strangest way I've ever seen. This guy is 100% evil, clearly, just just on the face of it. And he 100% pronounces it Ibiza, and it's the worst. Yeah. <laughs> he keeps telling you how much chorizo he buys. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, she got knocked up. Rando chorizo guy put his chorizo in her and gave her a uh, knocked up. And then her dad... Wouldn't let Carl see her because she was pregnant mm -hmm. and threw away all the flowers he brought and all the letters he wrote and made her disappear for nine months. <laughs> and then he stole her baby and gave it away. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lovely music cue in here as well, where it's uh, it, it's like looking at life in the rear view mirror reveals your destiny. And I just wanted to cut to a DJ like, you're listening to On The Nose FM, the home of all your painfully <laughs> apropos musical hits. <laughs> but yeah, her dad, the dad who we've spent the entire movie praising, everybody's favorite guy, stole his teen pregnant daughter's baby and mm -hmm. gave it away. Uh, and we will continue to see him as a hero throughout the rest of this. He will still be the hero of this. <laughs> yeah. Dolly Parton appears here. She got her pie and she's like, now nah, don't be too hard on your dad. Look at this doodly do. <laughs> and it's the scene outside of the hospital room where the dad stole the baby. And he's like, man, this is hard on me too. And Christine Baranski is like, oh, hard on him too. Well, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> You're in a musical with Dolly Parton on the Nose FM. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's her tragic backstory is that she got knocked up. She had the baby. Her dad stole the baby and gave it away. And that's why she left town. Oh, hmm. <laughs> yep. And then we get the end of a song about finding the light. They try to go back to the, the lantern lighting, the parable, the Scottish <laughs> yep. parable for a second. Yep. In song. Yeah. Dolly's going to sing to her that she's got to find her light. 
Her light. The what? Her light. Sorry, what am I finding? The light. Light. Got it. Okay. Christmas <laughs> on the square. So great. Yeah. <laughs> on the nose FM. Thanks, Dolly. So yeah, sounds like they're going to try and find the light. Solid cliffhanger. Apparently that's the hard sell for Act 3. <laughs> Will the plot of every 80s movie work out for the evil rich person? Will they find the light? <laughs> Will God reconsider the ramifications of suburban sprawl and what that means for the economy and the environment? Find out the answers to these questions and more <laughs> when we return for the syllabically challenged conclusion of Christmas on the Square. Where am I? Michael Marshall. Welcome to heaven. Oh my god, I'm dead. What happened to me? Uh, well, uh, Eli made a website and... Uh, you know what? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a good idea. But that's not all. You've been chosen to be an angel in training. Oh, um, hmm, I mean, it's a bit awkward. Like, honestly, I did like, quite a bit of public work while I was alive and I was hoping I'd just, you know... Here's your rule book. Oh, um... Okay, okay, fine. So, yeah, uh, r- rule one, mm-hmm. no child cancer stuff, stop asking. No child cancer stuff. That's right. That's a big one. That's why we did it number one. Uh, okay. Uh, rule two, no, we can't just give you the knowledge to be a full angel using God magic. Also, stop asking. Yep. Classic one. Very important as well. All right. So, I mean, what will I do? Uh, mostly, you'll be a personal assistant to a bad person in hopes that they'll become good. Okay. Um... Is there any chance I could win Angel of the Year? Uh, don't push it. Don't push it. Or I will send you where we sent Andy Wilson. Okay, okay, yeah, fine, fine. America. We sent him to America. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back. And Christine Baranski is coming out of the MRI machine right now to find out if an angel did in fact give her cancer. Okay, but... Like, she's changed her mind, too, right? Like, she's not going to sell the town now that she knows that when her dad stole her baby, he didn't enjoy it? Is that... How does that change your mind? (laughs) There's no way she hasn't changed her mind at this point. Also, by the way, when she comes out of the MRI machine, (laughs) does the doctor say, welcome back? Yeah, yeah. He like whispers it. Which does he do that a lot after MRIs? Because that's fucking creepy. <laughs> that's very. Was he the doctor? Like when her baby got stolen? Is that what he meant? Like welcome back to the hospital? <laughs> no, no idea. Just uh, I, I couldn't help but notice you were doing some pretty serious doodly doos in there. <laughs> welcome, back. welcome back to this time. Do you think they show up on the scan? Because it's MRI scan. Do you think her brain's lighting up in the doodly do region? <laughs> Holy shit, it's just blank for a little while. That's crazy. <laughs> Were you in a do uh, do with Dolly Parton? I was. And as she walks out of the hospital, this is how clumsily plotted this movie is. As she's walking out of the hospital into that same entrance is magical little black girl who is all hurt from a car crash her and her dad got in. Yeah, right there. And, and because this is the Scrooge bit where she's changed her mind, I want to be like, you the young girl who's been in a car crash, what day is this? Oh, I haven't <laughs> missed it. <laughs> right. But it's just supposed to be this like, so tragic thing. How could this possibly happen? So the dad's like, <laughs> explaining it to Christine Bransky for no reason. Mm-hmm. It's like, we were delivering flowers to her mother's grave. We had just fed all of the homeless and we cured AIDS. And how could this possibly have happened? It's the problem <laughs> of evil. It's the problem of evil. And I want him to carry on to be like, we were delivering flowers to her mother's grave and her mother wouldn't be dead if you didn't close the drugstore. So this car crash was also <laughs> your fault. <laughs> I don't know why she swallowed a fly. <laughs> Do you have a weird angel who's doing weird, spiteful stuff to you? You have to tell us because <laughs> it feels like now we're involved in your thing and that's kind of fucked up. She's 10. Oh, and it's great because she says to him like, oh, she's strong. She'll pull through. And he's like, how could you possibly know that? And he's like, shut the fuck up. So yeah, that's, <laughs> that is fair. That is well, fair. Yeah. She's a bartender. She's tough. Okay. <laughs> she's fine. I saw her glass a guy once who didn't want to leave the men's room if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Oh, oh, also the salon, the entire salon <laughs> arrived. The two gay dancers, the the, yeah. the the black friend. And they say, oh, Andy had to drive like a maniac to get here because of the traffic. And it's like, mm, he didn't have to do that because no. there's literally no reason for him to be there. <laughs> he chose to do that to there to rub a neck a child entering hospital. Don't worry, everyone. The sassy guy who works at the salon is here. It's all going to be okay. 
but she tells her assistant to get her the top pediatric neurosurgeon in the country and and fly her to a hospital in the middle of Kansas to <laughs> work on that girl's brain damage. Damn it. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then uh, Dolly Parton shows back up for a second to talk with Regina. And Regina's like, hey, Angel, um, maybe you want to not have little girls get in car crashes as part of the thing with me because I feel like now I'm involved in it. And Dolly Parton's like, phase one complete. <laughs> I really wanted her to be like, nah, I just do middle-aged lady consciences. I can get you the little girl car crashes guy and just some like bedraggled bags under his eyes. Angel shows up and he's like, fuck, I hate my job. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, God, another one. There's so many. So many little girl car crashes. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get, get a spot in the HR department. This is a really weird job, man. <laughs> Oh, and this, this is such a weird moment as well because, you know, Regina's told Felicity, her assistant, who's also an angel, to phone and get that uh, surgeon. And they play the, oh, Felicity's talking to Dolly Parton. Oh, she forgot to call the neurosurgeon. She has to be reminded because she's so ditzy. And that's a really weird comedy beat when you have a dying seven-year-old, like, <laughs> basically still right there. <laughs> she's standing at the, the child's grave. Ain't I a stinker? <laughs> <laughs> so... Now we're going to cut over to dad. And by this, I mean the dad of Magical Black Child. Mm-hmm. And he's going to give us possibly the least appropriate song in the movie. <laughs> a smooth, sexual, R&B-themed Please Don't Die of Head Trauma song. Right. I mean, at least he can sing. Like Other than Dolly Parton, he's the only person in this who has anywhere near approaching a good singing voice. So I was, I was just happy for the relief. He can sing. Absolutely. But the song is fucking insane. It mm-hmm. starts with like, hey, I know you're in a coma now. So like if you want to die and hang out with mom, who's also yes! dead, yes! that'd be cool. I would get it. And I'm at this point, I'm just like, please flatline credits, flatline credits. <laughs> Greatest ending to a movie ever. No. He says, if you're going to die, you're going to die. And I was like, fuck. Ah, oh, that would have been genius. No. Donald Trump sitting next to him is like, whoa, buddy, that's a little bit much. <laughs> a little bit much, guy. He also said, I always had a father's knowing that I'd be first to go. And it's like, did dads often get pleasure from thinking about dying before their kids? Is that a big thing? Of like, ah, <laughs> oh, I can't wait to die before you. That's going to be brilliant. <laughs> I mean, I can verify that it depends on where the child is in their sleep training. They're not making it through the night yet. That is a very comforting thought. <laughs> also, the thing is, bear in mind, this this kid has been hit by a car and rushed in. It's like, oh, that, that could be really bad. But it turns out, I don't think she's all that bad. She's, she, I don't think she needs a surgeon. She's not in, like, she's not prepped for surgery. She's not in, like, the emergency ward. She's just in a normal, a normal hospital room. She doesn't have a monitor on and her IV is clearly not connected to anything because you can see the end of it. So she's just bandaged a bit. Oh, no. That was, <laughs> that was just a Capri Sun that she liked to hang. <laughs> <laughs> and this is also where Dr. S. Machino walks in. She says, hello, I'm Dr. Martinez. I've been flown in from Kensington. And I wrote into my notes where all the best doctors are. Kensington, Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's like, hi, here's my job title and the method by which I arrived at the hospital today. This is a normal <laughs> thing for the start. And like, the surgeon is not even in a rush. She's been flown in. She's not scrubbed up. I'm calling it out. This kid is faking it. Yeah, I've seen Spinal Man. This kid is faking it. <laughs> she walks. This guy yeah. Ricker fucking walks. <laughs> so now Regina's back in the car and damn it if she doesn't want to go back and see her love interest. And mm-hmm. I know they're doing this because they need to wrap up the Carl Regina love story thing, but because of the way they've ordered the scenes in the movie, it seems like, you know, watching that little black girl almost die made me think about my ex-boyfriend. I should go talk this out with him. (laughs) It happens. That is the order of things that I thought just now. I, I have a different theory, which is she's going to see Carl because she's got some newly dead kids' toys to sell to him. Because <laughs> we know that's the line of business he's That's doing. what it is. She's got the hot tip. <laughs> she's got the hot tip. She's like, Carl, 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 you know the little bartender girl? I You know I've got a good lead for you. Get there and start talking <laughs> to the dad about pricing now because... 50-50, she's dying. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to get swooped by the fucking Salvation Army. <laughs> so like... 
Felicity then is, is having an argument with Dolly Parton about taking her to see Carl. And she's like, Dolly's like, no, don't do that. And she's trying to start a cock block her and stuff. Yeah. And then Felicity's saying, no, I'm going to bring this plane in for a landing. And like, she's talking about his dick there, right? Like 100% she's talking dick. about Carl's dick. Yep. No question. Could, could only be about his dick. Yeah. We actually learn rule number 17 is no letting your human fuck her high school boyfriend <laughs> yeah. feel better about how an almost dead girl is involved with her angel of spite. Yeah. And, and it's great that Felicity says that out loud because then Regina hears it and she's like, oh no, I just said I'm taking a shortcut through Blaine's landing. And I just wanted to carry on saying things and then conveniently covering them up. Like, mm? oh no, I said he's going to book your trains out. That's what he's booking your <laughs> trains out. <laughs> oh, so now, yeah, now we're back at the general store and Carl doesn't want to talk because he's busy packing up his open jelly beans and dead cancer kid memories. Yeah, and he's got to he's got to get out of there tonight because she said Christmas Eve is the deadline. It's already nighttime. He is midway through packing his first box. He's got one <laughs> box. Like he's not going to manage this. Wrecking ball. Yeah. <laughs> no. But yeah, she's like, "Tom, I want to explain." And he's like, "Damn it. No, there's still 30 minutes left in the movie." <laughs> so she just buys her dad's lantern from him. No, she doesn't buy it. He gives it to her for free. Oh, like, do all the businesses in this town just give <laughs> shit away for free? This is why they need to sell off all the parks and sell off everything to make a mall. You are all idiots. <laughs> this is this is how her dad ended up owning the town. He just walked into each place and was like, I own this town? And they were like, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'm 100% on team Christine Baranski for this whole movie. Like, she is <laughs> correctly doing the economy and they're all stupid. Yeah. Also, extra, extra on her team because in this moment, she apologizes to Carl because she left town because her stupid fucking Christian town, including him, all thought she was a whore because she got pregnant. Yes. Mm. She apologizes for that. Yeah. So, I'm sorry about all the pregnant I got. Yeah. And just think as well about what Carl's life has been, because we know that she left. Fine. Yeah, he was upset. In 40 years, apparently, he's not met anybody. He's just got a shop where he collects more and more dead kids things and occasionally goes to his ex-girlfriend's house to spy on her via her dad. That's been his life for the last 40 years, <laughs> and we want them to get back together. <laughs> Feels like they're not going to have a lot to talk about. But anyways, <laughs> after that, that disappointing conversation, she's back home, and Angel in training wants to know if she got some. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, Regina tells her, uh, he gave me my father's lantern. And she's like, great. But to be fair, Felicity is thinking the sex act, the father's lantern. Uh, if yep. you look it up, it's on Urban Dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this is where we get the quote of the movie, which is that grief is love with nowhere to go. And I just wrote my notes. What a stupid fucking quote. I mean, did it make me cry? Yes, but it's 2020. The other day I cried for 15 <laughs> minutes because I remembered that Iron Man was dead. <laughs> why would it be bad if love doesn't move wouldn't you want love to stand still sometimes <laughs> doesn't that just make sense love stop pacing so, so we're gonna <laughs> wing around the fucking town now preacher's wife is sad that she doesn't have a baby like the way she's handling the baby clothes to pack them up and, and we touched on this earlier they've got this baby clothes shop but the way she's handling them while pining so hard for a baby makes me 100% certain that her plan in opening this store was to lure a baby in and kidnap it. That is why <laughs> they've got this store. That's what they meant by fertility treatment. Or find babies that just died and then buy their used onesies just like that <laughs> dead baby toy store next door. <laughs> the, the, the foundation of this town's economy is dead children. Dead and kidnapped Very much. children. That's why her dad gave it away. <laughs> <laughs> we do get the good news that Violet's improving, which is which is encouraging because it's been like an hour since she was taken at the hospital and she's already improving. So I think she's going to pull through, guys. Yeah. Yeah. And Pastor Guy, uh, Adele's husband, is very excited. He's like, oh, the little girl who got into a horrible car accident is not dead. God is love. I'm going to use this in my Christmas Eve sermon. <laughs> oh, and there's, there's an amazing bit where they're with the pastor's wife and she's talking about how she's going to get pregnant. And I wrote my notes, look, we know Dolly can shrink really small because we saw her do that in the car to hide from the, the mean lady. I think she's going to shrink down and like personally hand deliver a sperm to the egg. And <laughs> okay. That almost happens. Yes. <laughs> That's basically what happens. Uh, 45 seconds after both Marsh and I wrote Dolly Parton's gonna knock this lady up jokes in our notes 
Dolly Parton wiggles her fingers and sends angel magic at her tummy, which is absolutely how Dolly Parton thinks babies are made. Yeah, yeah. She uses her Star Trek teleporting powers to teleport come into the pastor's life. That is what she's doing there. Also, I just want to say, if this movie were accurate, pastor's wife would immediately start vomiting from morning sickness. That's how we'd know it took. <laughs> oh, man, if you could beam up sperm, that's interesting. <laughs> Did they ever explore that in Star Trek at all? I, I don't think they ever went that blue, to be honest. I, <laughs> gotta I ask Callie kept, about uh, this. Yeah, Callie I was going to say, know. we got to check in with Callie if there are any <laughs> cum related episodes of Enterprise. So, meanwhile, back at her house, Regina is looking at her contracts and, coincidentally, stroking her father's lamp. <laughs> and she's looking at the old painting of her dad on the mantle. And she's just like, well, I guess uh, I guess I was 100% right about lanterns not spurring the economy here. <laughs> I guess I'm still going to sell the town. You're an idiot. But yeah, she's she's stroking the lamp. And wouldn't you know it? She strokes the lamp in such a way that it's secret <laughs> lamp compartment filled with the end of the movie opens. <laughs> There's literally a Bible inside, right? This is where the yes. Bible falls yeah. out of the secret Bible slot inside it's, the lantern. It's her family Bible. And I, I wrote in my notes, I was like, what the fuck's a family Bible? Dolly luckily sings an explanation right away, but it's a, <laughs> it's a real thing. People write like their entire family history in the front of the Bible. So like, all right, let's see how the universe was made. Wait, 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 before I start. Okay, my dad was named Nick. I'm Steve. <laughs> my daughter's named Stephanie. Okay, good, good, good. All right, in the beginning. Wait, hold on. I got another one. Uh, my daughter, Regina Fuller, had a baby boy, and he was put up for adoption. And when I found out it was a baby boy, I really badly wanted to be the gay backing dancer. I thought, let's just let's just bring it around to that, please. <laughs> also, weird to write about your daughter's baby in the passive voice like that. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you stole the kid. That was yeah. you who did that. Mm, yeah, but we still treat him like, it's like, yeah, he, he kept a book with the name of a child he stole written in it, but he's a good guy. But, you know, she's thinking, oh, what a lovely fella. It's been 40 years without my son, which is eh, less than ideal all told, but wasn't that a good guy? <laughs> but he did have a secret book in the bottom of this lamp. I'm going to say squaresies. Squaresies? <laughs> squaresies. <laughs> So now we're going to cut over to the town church where Marjorie is uh, explaining how mysterious God's ways are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this is like uh, midnight mass, right? This is like Christmas Eve midnight mass they're supposed to be doing here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just dying for another, like a wrecking ball exactly at midnight to fuck up their thing. No. But they all have to leave their businesses on Christmas Eve. Like, have they not got better things to do than be in church right now? Like, they should be, pr I, I think God would give them a pass when they were being evicted at this very moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they could get into like a dance fight with the like musical demolition crew after the wrecking ball comes in. <laughs> no. <laughs> There's some great lines from the pastor's wife. She says, well, I think it's the pastor actually says, faith opens a door and miracles can enter. And I wanted his wife to be like, yeah. Anyway, speaking of being entered by miracles, uh, you'll never guess what Angel Dolly Parton <laughs> shot into me. You'll never guess what I did with my father's lantern, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and then like two lines later, the, the pastor says, miracles come in all sorts of ways. And I wanted to be like, yeah, anyways, uh, speaking of miracle come, uh, can I just tell you about the change? <laughs> Do you know what Scotty can do? <laughs> uh, was Christine Baranski also runs into her doctor here and he's like, you don't have a brain tumor. That was really a pointless part of this movie now that I think about it. <laughs> the fact that you that was just a false alarm on your x-ray. Just We were supposed to worry about the villain for a second. We needed you in an MRI machine. I have no idea why we did any of that. <laughs> Anyways, you know, Christmas. <laughs> yep. And then they all sing a song. More more like we're not trying hard enough as a song. <laughs> yeah. And the, the song is like, we haven't been praying hard enough, the song. And that's so sad. That's religion in a nutshell. That's like, if you really believe it, you must constantly be thinking to yourself like, fuck, still not hard enough with the praying because <laughs> this never works. <laughs> yeah. But this is where Christine Baranski comes in and she's wearing all white now because she's had a change of heart. And she's like, hello, everybody. Um... I'm sorry about selling the town out from under you, but there's only about 11 minutes left in the movie. <laughs> Five, if you count credits. So 
I'm not going to sell the town. And this is my dad's family Bible. And the way I've decided to reveal my <laughs> tragic backstory, which involves teen pregnancy and a stolen child, is here at Christmas Eve Mass. <laughs> yes. Really wanted like a fucking montage of her ex gesturing the fucking that she got in the broom closet of the sock up. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, when she does an entrance and, and, and say all of that, we do at one point cut to the mailman and he is still shaking his head like, I mean, still, fuck her, right? Like, fuck her, fuck <laughs> this. <laughs> he's still up for killing her. There's, a, there's 100% he's still got that. Uh, he's like, we're all down for this still, yeah? Yeah. But of course, the big reveal here is, so then the pastor gets up, Right. And he's like, hey, everybody, Violet woke up and there's cheering. And I just wrote in my notes, wait, he waited for everyone to sit down so that he could get that moment in his speech. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like everyone's going to be massively relieved because she's been out of it like all afternoon or so. Like she's been unconscious for a, a, about half an hour at this point. Minutes. So, oof, it was close. <laughs> and then he does. a. it gets better. He literally says it gets better. Then the little girl who was in a car crash earlier tonight <laughs> didn't die. I'm the baby that got put up for adoption. Yeah, it's like it gets better. I've got some white people news as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so yeah, that's it. He's like, yeah, I'm her son. And Regina's like, yep, that's that's the end of the movie. And then Dolly appears to sing about how great the movie was. <laughs> Oh, and she's got the giant angel wings and she's like hovering up behind it. She was looking good. She was looking real good here, I thought. Mm -hmm. So th they all sing a celebratory The Movie Is Over song. Mm -hmm. Christine sings a little bit here. The She sings an I'm Sorry I Was Such a Bitch verse. Yeah, her, her verse is uh, I've shattered your dreams and that I regret. From this moment on, I'll give it my best. Which is just soaring. That is soaring and inspirational <laughs> stuff. <laughs> also, like, she keeps making a big... Th I think she gives, uh, I think, either uh, the pastor, she gives him her father's lamp. They keep going on about lamps and stuff. And I thought, this movie makes a really big deal out of street lighting. Is that not something that everywhere has in America? Is that, like, a weird thing for some places? Kansas? <laughs> I don't know. Probably not. They don't have no. shit in Kansas. Yeah. No, we barely have roads at this point. It's been a rough four years. I pick. I picture Kansas. This it's it's the Wizard of Oz. Like I pick Kansas is, <laughs> looks like that to me. I'm sure it's the same. And the thing is as well that the pastor looks intensely uncomfortable. Again, he's close to his wife. He looks intensely uncomfortable with the physical contact with his wife. And I'm ninety percent certain that's why it took Dolly Parton to knock her up. That is the real <laughs> issue they've been having. <laughs> yep. And uh, who should show up to their celebratory song but Violet? Because. They often let little girls out of the hospital the day they wake up. Yeah. <laughs> she was only hit by the car this afternoon. It was dark <laughs> when she was brought into the hospital. <laughs> I, I really wanted them to be like, anyway, kid, uh, the bar's not going to open itself. So uh, off, off you go. You wanna, uh... Some guys just immediately start shaking an empty bowl of peanuts at her. Fuck, dad, I got to get this one second. <laughs> He's ordered one Sam Adams all night. <laughs> Ugh, it's 506. I need to get the manager card to clock. It won't even uh, let me clock in. Or... Oh no, there's a bachelorette <laughs> party. Bachelorette party. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's the uh, movie. Oh, one last thing. Right before the very end, just so that we know Christine and Carl are going to end up together, he goes, I believe you owe me a dance. And I really wanted him to be like, and some pussy if your story <laughs> is accurate. <laughs> Also, right at the very, very end, like Dolly appears on top of the church alongside Felicity and does the kind of like, oh, you got your wings kind of now. And then she directly addresses us in a way that yes, worried does. me so much. <laughs> For a moment, I thought my webcam had been hacked and she was speaking directly to me. I was really terrified, but panicked for a moment. I was hoping she was just going to be like, yeah, good job, Felicity, but you will need another week of training where you follow me on the shift. These tips are mine. <laughs> I keep tips. <laughs> Yeah. Well, in summation of that movie musical, TLDR, I guess, TLDW. <laughs> uh, also yep. a good subtitle for this podcast in general. <laughs> so to close it out, you guys want to give us a quick review of this musical, five words or less. Go. Dolly Parton can't read good. <laughs> well done. 
I'm going to say it again. I think I peaked with uh, a Christmas Karen. Christmas Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Less than five. Good job. Good job. Brevity. Key to good communication. <laughs> Not something this movie knows about. Well, that does it for our review of Christmas on the Square, but that's not going to do it for the episode just yet because the Christmas tacular continues. So, Eli, what's on deck? Well, Heath, we'll be continuing our Christmas tacular with another Chip Rossetti flick. God the, uh, damn it. Are creator we really? of Gramps Goes to College. Yes, this one's called Motherfuck. The Borrowed Christmas. Gramps goes to Christmas. Get excited. I will not get... I quit the show. <laughs> <laughs> Chip Rosette, it's unwatchable. It's so rough. Woo! God damn it. All right. Well, with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 276 <laughs> to a merciful close. That was the final episode of GAM, everybody. 276. <laughs> As always, big thanks to Marsh for joining us. Marsh, would you like to plug anything in particular? Yeah, you can hear my fortnightly skeptical analysis show, Skeptics with a K, which I co-host. Fortnightly? And, uh, fortnightly. You know, fancy we're, way we're, to describe that. Nice. We're British. We we, we drop a fortnight now Okay, what then. does bi-weekly mean? Uh, it means both those things. It means uh, twice Stupid a week and every other week. fucking word. Yeah, fortnightly mm. from now on. Good job. Or it's a week that wants the attention. <laughs> okay. No, I, 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 I'm with you. I got it. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can check that out or you can check out the work we're doing at The Skeptic uh, at skeptic.org UK, which is kind of uh, the, the UK Skeptic magazine. I'm really happy about some of the stuff we've been publishing. And Noah put a piece up recently for us all about how religion ruined Trump's response to COVID in America. It so ruined it's really our perfectly piece. good pandemic, as the yep. subtitle yeah, exactly. of his book recently suggested. Yes. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Well, of course, big thanks to all our Patreon donors as well for all the generosity. If you'd like to help support the show, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful, and I'll get you early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help us out by leaving us good reviews and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist, Citation Needed, The Skeptocrat, and D&D Minus, available in all the podcast places. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slonick of Evil Drafts on Mars. All other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and all that was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Michael Marshall and Eli Bosnick, I'm Heath Enright. Promise to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Animal House Clothes. Breakfast Club. Animal House Clothes. Nine months later, the pastor's wife gave birth to a pale, blonde baby and split from the pastor after a paternity <laughs> test revealed it was Dolly Parton's kid all along. <laughs> Dolly Parton got demoted from being an angel for breaking rule number 72, subsection J. No putting little girls in a coma to teach someone else a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone in town died of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're in Kansas. Dolly Parton cured COVID. She sure did. Still, go fuck yourself. <laughs> it got so much dirtier the way you said it. <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.